As you move further into defining some of the elements of conflict, power is just another major element that contributes to how relationships are viewed. So we're gonna look at defining power's characteristics, the power currencies, and power and gender. So we we'll look at this idea of defining power, there's this idea that it's always present. So there's always gonna be some element of power, but it could be that you're in a symmetrical relationship where that power is balanced. So this might be a friendship. You have those elements where there's agreement between those two and, and, and a sharing. I know I have some friendships where I have where there's the communication goes both ways. I talk and my friend talks. There's other relationships I have where I end up being the listener most of the time. That happens in relationships. So there's there's those kinds of elements that happen, but there's also just this idea of of how those relationships are are flowing. There's complementary relationships was actually suggesting an imbalance of relation uh, of power. And that happens maybe with a parent or child that can create that or a boss and a uh, employee kind of situation where there's clearly um, boundaries and there's one person that is sitting at a higher level of power than the other. We can look at the dyadic power theory that's mentioned in the textbook, and it talks about people who are more likely to control communication, and they're generally the people that are, I guess I would call them, you might call them mid-managers. They are maybe, their, their authority is questioned. So if their authority is questioned, they're more likely to feel like they have to push their power around or tell people that they're in power. There's a lot of people that I've met that have a natural element of grabbing people's attention, of having powerful communication, and they're gonna get it naturally. There's other people that get some power from their job position, and their job position gives them power. But if they don't, if they think that their power is in question or their power is limited, then there might be an element of trying to control communication, which relates back to the dyadic power theory. They also have elements of ethics that relate back to communication and power and how someone uses their power. A person can use their power where they might have control over resources and make decisions and do, do things in a way that's gonna be supportive to the people that are involved. And there's other people that are going to make decisions and that have power that are going to make decisions that are going to be most beneficial to them or their family or people that are on their side. So I think we look at the idea of how when a person uses power, are we using power in, in an ethical way? Power is granted. It doesn't hang out in the person. Um, I think sometimes, again, sometimes it comes with a job position. But really, a lot of power comes from the way that a person is, the way people choose to give that to them. I, I believe that we teach people how to treat us. And, you know, we give permission for someone to have influence over us. So this idea that power is granted is really more about, I'm allowing someone else to have power. And I am oftentimes giving it. There are situations where, you know, if a person that's in prison, it's very clear, you know, they, a lot of their life is controlled. If you're in the military, there's rules, there's direction. You don't really have as much choice about power in those kinds of situations because they're more institutions and the rules and expectations are very clear there. But we oftentimes give we oftentimes grant power to someone and give them the opportunity to influence us. And then power influences conflicts. So again, the person that has the choice of making the decision oftentimes um, the, 
the person that has the power in certain situations is going to have more say over how the conflict might end. So I think these elements all kind of go into how these, how power is defined. So we go from power definition into power currency. And so th I think these are interesting because I don't know that people always think about these as, as what they really are. Because I think when we look at some of these elements, some people may not define them that way, but if you stop and think about it, I think they can be pretty powerful tools. So the first one that we look at is this idea of resources. Now I think this one's pretty clear. If a person has more materials, if they have more money, if they have more property, if they have the food, food's a big deal guys. So if we look at those elements, who has the resources? Well, that person has the resources, therefore they have the power. So that you'll see that a lot, I think of with siblings, when one has something that the other one wants, they have more power over something. So that, this idea of resources, who has more power, who has more money, I think it's also is a cultural element. So we'll talk about that in just a second. But this idea of culture can kind of play into that because if some cultures really buy into that idea and it's okay to have a big disparity between those that have and those that have not. But um, other cultures, we're trying to keep things more equal and more equitable between people. But in our culture, we, in American culture, we have a tendency to see somebody that has more money or more property as being more valuable than another person. I, I'm going to use the value term here because I think that that's kind of a truth. Another one would be skills and uh, skills or knowledge. So if a person has knowledge in a specific area, that gives them some power. If they have expertise in, you know, building websites or they have expertise as uh, a college professor, someone that has a degree in a specific area, that person's considered to have more expertise currency. So the, the social network, and I know that people will have a tendency to refer that back to social network like Facebook, but this is more looking at a person as being a people connector. This is a person that knows a lot of people. I think about this with my realtor friend. I mean, um, she knows all kinds of people. So she's a really good people connector. She's really good at helping people find other people. So you know, as a realtor, as a, as a friend, as a human being, she has a great deal of value because that's one of her skills. It's one of the things that she does really, really well. So personal currency. Now this one's interesting and I think some people might argue, but I don't think there's really much to argue about. A person has personal currency in that they might be beautiful or a person might be intelligent or they might have charisma or a sense of humor. They're just a really good communicator. And they actually have done some really interesting research on the way that a person looks. If somebody's physically attractive, they're more likely to get certain types of jobs. And actually most jobs, because there is a, a certain currency that goes along with being attractive. And it it's, may not seem fair, but it is does seem to be, um, something that happens culturally and then intimacy so if you share a bond or connection with someone they might be more likely to do something for you than they might for somebody else so that close bond gives you some connection with that person and I will do things for my friends that I won't do for just anybody so if they built a relationship with me that's a big deal to me So power and gender, this idea of most societies, at least, I mean, I'm gonna talk about the American culture in general is what we call patriarchal. And that is the rule of fathers, meaning that most of the stuff is ruled by males. And I, I don't remember if I talked about this before, but I think it's an important idea. Oftentimes, this idea of male versus female happens because 
when a man uh, because a woman is uh, has the mammary glands attached to her body she's sort of forced to stay near her children in order to feed them which doesn't allow her to stray doesn't allow her to go very far and so oftentimes women in cultures would end up being the gatherers in the society and the males would be the hunters in the society and be able to go further away from the family in order to hunt and then bring the food back to the home. The other thing that I think influences things is that when women are have children, the women know for the most part that the child, I mean, if we go back a hundred years, now there's some different rules, but if we go back a hundred years, we can say if a woman is carrying a baby in her belly, then the baby is hers. But the man could not say for certain that the baby in a woman's belly was his. And so there would be all kinds of things that would happen culturally that would, uh, they would do f to women to make sure that they were staying and being the only one that they were being with was their husband to make sure that the baby that came out of them was belonged to the husband. So you'll see different things happen in culture that will change this idea of gender and how people are related to each other because of the nature of the way our bodies are put together and the fact that women can have children. So you will see some cultures, in, in truth there's some Native American cultures that are matriarchal and they, where the, where the information, where rule passes down through the female side of the family. We also have patri patrilineal and matrilineal, meaning that the lineage of property being passed down goes either through the father or through the mother. So you'll see these different elements, but for the most part, the patriarchal society seems to be more prominent um, just in general. And so oftentimes that idea of male rule ends up being more prominent. The other element I can say is over years and over generations, there has been more equalization between them but there is still a disparity between economic opportunities, oftentimes between males and females, where a male may be paid more money than a female. So I remember working in the restaurant business for many, many years, and working in the restaurant business, the oftentimes the guys would make more tips than I did. And, you know, I questioned that, not, you know, and maybe they were just good at what they did and that's awesome, but it didn't seem to be that. So I, I remember questioning that, you know, why, why would that happen? Why would guys make more money? And it turned out and asking some people that oftentimes people think that the guys are supporting families. And so their income is there to help support a family. And what's oftentimes true is, there's a lot of single parent families where the woman is the head of the household, but the perception is that if it were a man, then the man would be supporting a family. And so oftentimes he would get tipped more. So I don't know if that's true. I don't know. I mean, I was just questioning it when I was working in the restaurant business, you know, wondering, you know, what, what might be kind of the underlying idea be behind that. And I don't know that I've never done a study to find out, if men make more money than women when they serve tables, but I think it would be interesting to try to find out if there really was a disparity in that particular area, because there is in a lot of the more, um, in a lot of positions where a, a male might make more money than a female doing the same job. So, yeah. And I mentioned the culture, but I think the big thing to know about the culture element is, you know, that cultures can be different and the culture might be set up in a different way. So if it's a patriarchal 
patriarchal or matriarchal, you know, those elements can kind of shift it. Or if the culture believes less in disparity, like they're, they don't believe that there should be a huge difference between those that have and those that have not. So you will see sort of um, a balance between those elements. All right, there we go. Thank you.